Good afternoon and uh, welcome then to this uh, chapter, which I believe is chapter 15 of this uh, series of talks on um, uh, the expeditions of, of James Cook. And um, I'm going to move on now. I've done a series of videos uh, talking about the um, first expedition, then the second and the third, and the different questions and themes and discussions and debates which came up uh, in connection with the with the, the different stages uh, of the journeys. Uh, and now we're going to move out to uh, another perspective, um, and this is James Cook and the and the history of science. Now, quite understandably, our first uh, approach to Cook was to look at Cook the hero. It, in inverted commas, um, Cook and his empire, Cook and the relations with uh, uh, indigenous peoples, um, uh, Cook and uh, cartography and so on. Um, because those are the first questions which, which come to mind. Uh, but Cook actually was also a scientist. Um, I mean, he was a real scientist. He wasn't just somebody who did some science because his uh, military superior ordered him to. And we will see that uh, as we go along. That's one of the themes of today's. Now, I'm uh, very much relying on uh, the work of other colleagues here, in particular, Valérie uh, Alérac, uh, Sandia Patel, uh, and the book uh, uh, by Roy Porter. Uh, so that's what's like where I'm mostly based on. But I have some ideas of my own as well. You'll have to find them in there. Uh, and I'm going to work on this in, in, in ooh, a, 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 a series of uh, themes. I, I wonder if I'll get right to the end. I probably will. Um, the Enlightenment, the Royal Society, Astronomy, Longitude, Scurvy, Botany, Ethnography. I'm not sure if I'll get quite to the end. Uh, and in, in a series of half hour chapters. So there'll, there'll probably be at least three uh, anyway. So let's begin with um, the Enlightenment, or as, a, as, a, as we say in, Fre in French, le siècle des Lumières. And of course, this is a wonderful um, name for a period in history. It's one of these very positive names, you know, like uh, the Renaissance. And, you know, who could be against the Renaissance? You know, the Enlightenment, or uh, in French, les Trente Glorieuses, uh, uh, what, we, what in English we call the post-war boom in French is called the 30 Glorious Years. Um, and so you're a very, very positive word, but uh, uh, in fact, and then, you know, generally taken to mean that period when um, the um, intellectuals began to move away from theology and uh, biblical exegesis uh, and uh, to uh, look for evidence for, uh, for different theories of, of, of how the world works. And this will it be, include all sorts of areas. For example, um, geology will become important because they'll be uh, gradually realizing that some of the, uh, uh, some of the fossils and some of the uh, rock uh, layers are far, far older than the official beginning of the world according to the Bible, which was carefully uh, calculated to be uh, about, uh, about 6,000 years ago. So let's have a look at the, the, this idea of the Enlightenment. Now the Enlightenment then a, pe a period of profound change. That doesn't really, that's some, a, a definition I got from somewhere. It doesn't really tell us very much because most people believe that whatever period they, they're living in uh, is a period of, of, uh, of, uh, of complete change. Uh, but certainly uh, there's been a huge debate about what exactly the Enlightenment is. Certainly it, it involves an important rise of science. And if we just stick to uh, the British, uh, a couple of British examples uh, in the in with the Scottish Enlightenment, because Edinburgh University and, and Edinburgh in general was a major um, uh, centre, uh, and these would include people like Adam Smith and uh, uh, and him writing his book, The Wealth of Nations, which asked the question, where does the why do we have rich countries and, and poor countries? Where does the wealth come from? How can we explain it? Uh, so you see, we're very, very long way away from, oh, well, God must have wanted it that way. That's why it is, you know, uh, and we're not looking to the, the uh, authority either of the church or of religious um, and, uh, scripture. And then Hume and Locke uh, and uh, other philosophers in Scotland, who some of whom were coming up with the idea that um, the basis of ethics, the basis of knowing what is right and wrong, does not come from God. Uh, it comes from human human nature. This this sort of thing. One of the uh, books which has recently come out, or in the last few years, uh, is the um, the Enlightenment and why it still matters. 
uh, and that underlines the uh, difficulty in defining the concept of the Enlightenment, and and uh, and he underlines that it has been the subject of irate and furious debates ever since the 18th century uh, uh, itself. And certainly, one of the things that, that we've uh, understood more recently is that the Enlightenment. Oh, it sounds very good, the Enlightenment, but the 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 uh, the century of the Enlightenment is also the century of slavery, uh, and indeed, some of the uh, great uh, writers. Um, who wrote about the Enlightenment ideas were also slave owners. This is the, the big contradictions um, of, uh, of, hu of human history. Um, now, although the Enlightenment is, uh, is uh, characterized by a move away from religious or divine uh, explanations of, uh, of the world. This does not mean that atheism was particularly widespread, but it does mean that in explaining the world, people began to look for evidence and theory uh, and not take the position that there was no need for these because the Bible gave us all the information uh, we needed. This is the period of the, of, in France, Diderot's uh, encyclopedia, which was tremendously ambitious and hoped to include all of the world's knowledge. Uh, so it's also a very exciting adventure and, you know, no doubt naive in some ways, because, of course, they didn't get to uh, all the world's knowledge. Uh, and uh, the uh, voyages of exploration, the expeditions of exploration, whether it be Wallace or Bougainville or Carteret uh, of the 18th century, which were made possible by uh, the improvements in ships. Um, and also by various uh, improvements um, in astronomy and, uh, and, uh, and a series of expeditions to the Southern Hemisphere to study what the stars are like there, because remember, navigating by the stars was the main way of, uh, of, of getting around places. And also the um, expansion of commerce meant that it was suddenly more interesting to go to see, well, just, you know, this Southern continent continent which everybody knows exists everybody knows exists uh, let's go and find it because you know now is the time because we've got you know we've got the ships we've got uh, what is what is necessary what is necessary uh, and so the voyages were part of the uh, enlightenment and the the building of uh, of the importance of science uh, uh, was in was, was in there now this is a long period uh, and the royal society the first national um, scientific society in the world was founded in 16, uh, 1662. Um, what not necessarily very popular at the beginning, uh, Porter says it was open to derision at the, be uh, at the beginning. Uh, and although this was the first one, um, this was uh, very uh, followed very, very um, quickly by the French Académie des Sciences. So it was, you know, something that was, was on the way. And of course, this is the, this is the uh, century of Isaac Newton, um, and, uh, and and what he what he he's going for by the middle of the 18th century 1750 uh, it felt like knowledge of all aspects of nature was advancing on a broad front you know, newton had done his uh, uh, had, uh he may already have died actually it certainly wasn't wasn't very well uh wasn't far from dying um uh and for example uh, linnaeus uh, had uh, uh, developed his system for classifying the kingdoms of nature. Uh, Linnaeus is the person who we need to thank for the system of, uh, of uh, naming, uh, naming uh, species normally by two or three Latin words. You know, we talk about Homo sapiens, and this, this system was invented by Linnaeus. So this is the idea um, that we can be ambitious. We can invent a system which can uh, classify all of the animals and all of the plants. Um, in, 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 the, in the world. Uh, and uh, science became um, something which was part of uh, the educated people's world. It was, uh, it was considered to be uh, fashionable in society to have uh, a, a microscope or a telescope or a, a collection of insects or birds. Um, this, was, uh, this, was the, this was part of the 18th century um, um, ruling classes uh, 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 elite uh, pastimes. And there is a link then, as I said, with the Cook, Cook's expeditions, because he will uh, depend on advances in technologies 
better ships with the three masts instead of the two masts, which apparently makes it easier to sail against the wind. Um, uh, a whole series of uh, instruments, you have better telescopes, better um, uh, the better measurement of the magnetic field of the of, of the Earth, not just with compasses, but also with dipping needles, uh, which me measure the vertical uh, aspect of the of the magnetic field, field and so on. Uh, and of course, when uh, uh, Cook came back, from, especially from his first expedition, with a huge number of samples of plants and animals and uh, maps of new places and uh, vague descriptions of new kinds of people's customs, and then this was all fuel uh, for this uh, um, culture of uh, curiosity uh, and, and explanation. Now, one of the institutions, because when you have a new social trend, there are usually new institutions to go along with them. I've, I've already mentioned is the uh, is the is the Royal Society, and I'll come into that with just a moment. First of all, just this little picture. This is actually the de desk of Joseph Banks aboard the en Endeavour. Now, he didn't have a big office, and in fact, that is in the in the main place where they also had their dinner. Um, but uh, you can see the the bookshelves, and those will include Lilius. Uh, and uh, and other um, um, uh, works in natural in natural history. So to get on, as I promised, to the Royal Society. Now the lion is only there because uh, in in PowerPoint you have you can click on a button and say uh, create me automatically a slide on this theme, and that's what it gave me. So why not? Um, now the Royal Society then was set up just after the restoration of the monarchy in Britain, 1660. So after the uh, civil war, which destroyed the absolute monarchy in Britain uh, and the time of uh, Oliver Cromwell as uh, Lord Protector, um, then it was decided among the elite to bring the monarchy back, but on a completely new basis basically on the basis that Parliament was boss and the king was no longer boss, uh, to such an extent that they actually um, uh, voted to pay him a salary. Instead of the old idea, everything belongs to the king uh, and, we, and we hold things because of the favour of the king. This was a new, new, new thing. The king is important, but he receives a salary from the Parliament. So obviously par Parliament was right there. Nevertheless, uh, because of the, 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 the civil war, um, their Royal Society, the atmosphere in which the Royal Society was founded was an atmosphere where there was a tremendous desire among the elite for stability. Uh, and they, they wanted things to be set up with rules and, uh, and, and, and be stable, or at least uh, uh, so commentators have said. Uh, and it's no accident that the uh, Royal Society is established uh, at the same time as the first national museum uh, in Britain, which is the Ashmolean in Oxford. Uh, now, I do recommend this, uh, in, in passing, I do recommend this, uh, this uh, lecture, which you can find on YouTube uh, by Professor Michael Hunt Hunter on the first, uh, the first decades uh, of the, of the uh, Royal, Royal Society. Um, now, in fact, when they, oh, and there is the Ashmolean today, in fact, when they set up the Royal Society, people were rather surprised to, to see that that was its, its name, the Royal Society. They were expecting to be called the Society for Natural Philosophy or something. Um, but in any case, the Royal Society was established with uh, quite a bureaucratic structure, very precise rules. New members had to be formally proposed, and the proposal was confirmed by secret ballot. And then the new member had to pay an annual fee. Uh, and so uh, it's interesting to note that the, 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 the Royal Society then was based in London, not in Oxford and Cambridge, the great universities who were still rather, I think it's fair to say, rather more interested in classical um, studies than, uh, than in science. Now, the Royal Society was tremendously ambitious and they aimed at understanding all sciences uh, and they, they declared that they wanted to establish a complete history of technology. Uh, as the first secretary uh, said, we wish, I quote, to scrutinize the whole of nature. And they also hoped to uh, collect a complete museum of nature. Of course, this was far, far too ambitious to, act to, act to act actually happen. And this is in parallel, uh, really, with the, the rise of capitalism and the idea that, you know, that the um, that, that, that commerce and uh, uh, and science can put the, the world at the feet of those who, who can who control them. Uh, the uh, Royal Society began a number of uh, habits uh, which 
uh, will be very useful to modern science. First of all, they, they published articles collectively very often as by members of the Royal Society. Uh, and it very rapidly became a forum for arbitrating experiments carried out elsewhere. That is, it almost became a form of peer review. That is that scientists in France or in Spain who had carried out experiments would send all their results to the Royal Society and, and ask for their uh, approval, validation. And so it became like, a, uh, like some of the great scientific reviews today, uh, guaranteeing. Uh, they also encouraged that the, uh, the, the writing up of the experiments uh, should be sober, should be very objective. Because um, uh, at this time, science is still very much mixed up with many other things, for example, um, a circus. Uh, because when you have a, a new uh, uh, phenomenon that you've discovered, like static electricity, which was a big thing, or the hot air balloon, which was a tremendous recently, uh, well, one of the ways to to make a little money out of it was to have a big spectacle and, uh, and uh, you get people to pay. Uh, whereas the Royal Society, on the contrary, uh, began to establish this atmosphere of serious scientific review. Uh, the society decided that they were not going to study magic. Now, today, that doesn't surprise us very much. If you go to any uh, faculty of science uh, uh, and you say, oh, yeah, I'd just like to do some experiments on magic. Is that all right? Well, they'll, they'll probably throw you out on their ear. Uh, however, on your ear. But how, however, at the time, this was, uh, this was not so obvious. Some of its members, some of the members of the Royal Society were very much interested in magic. And indeed, Isaac Newton was very much interested in what we would today consider to be magical, for example, alchemy. Uh, indeed, Isaac Newton, although he made these tremendous advances in optics and in gravity, just to mention two mechanics, uh, he was also very, very interested in theology. He wrote about theology uh, and he was very interested in, in alchemy, the, the, the uh, uh, magical predecessor of chemistry, if you like. Now, the Royal Society had hoped to get a lot of money from the king and uh, build its own uh, uh, building to represent the Royal Society. And this didn't happen. Uh, and for quite a long time, then the Royal Society was really quite a modest setup. Each uh, each member had to pay fifty two shillings a year, which was a lot of money in those days. But nevertheless, the, the Royal Society had a few employees, uh, six or seven employees, maybe ten or twelve. It was not some huge organisation. I mean, the, the the smallest university these days has hundreds of employee em, employees. So this was part of uh, the, 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 so established in 1660 and built up over the next uh, 50, 60, 70 years. Um, the, the Royal Society was part of this atmosphere that, that science seemed to be rushing forward. And this was uh, 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 also paralleled, uh, if you like, by technology, because uh, uh, from the middle of the 18th century onwards, more and more canals were being built in Britain. The, the canals transformed uh, the British economy because uh, they cut the cost of transporting products uh, a long way uh, massively. And of course, if you cannot transport your products cheaply, it may be better not to make them. Yeah, so there's no, there would be no, there's no reason to produce three times as many um, uh, tables or chairs and plows if you can't transport them. So in the 18th century, to go back to the Royal, 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 Royal Society, uh, Isaac Newton uh, was uh, the, um, the president um, of the Royal Society at the beginning um, of, the, uh, of the century. And by the end of the century, it was Joseph Banks, uh, our, our friend Joseph Banks, who in his youth uh, had gone uh, around uh, the world with, uh, with James Cook uh, on the endeavor. They were very ambitious, uh, although they fairly quickly uh, abandoned the idea of uh, writing the history of all technology. They were fairly ambitious and, and fairly adventurous. Uh, for example, in 1712, uh, 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 a writer went to see one of their meetings and found that they were just busy dissecting a dolphin. Not this dolphin, actually, another dolphin, but there you, there you go. Uh, it was also very much uh, of its time. It was very prone to factual, factualism. The, uh, they fought uh, uh, the one against the other inside the Royal Society. The, the botanists wanted all the money for botany and the astronomers wanted all the, all the money for, for astronomy and so, and, and so on and, uh, uh, and so forth. Uh, Banks became president in 1778, in fact, so after... Um, just uh, uh, as Cook's uh, contribution 
to exploration was coming to an end, he remained president for 41 years until his death. And we, and no doubt for a period was more well known than James Cook. Um, and uh, he was close to the king, he was a friend of the kings and he used this to, to build it up. And, and also he, he was a, uh, an uh, influential uh, advisor and it was his idea, uh, perhaps you remember, to establish a penal colony in Botany Bay uh, in, in near Sydney. Uh, he was also involved in exporting sheep to Australia. <coughs> uh, he was part of the botany faction, of course, he was a bot botanist. And the astronomers and the mathematicians were rather angry with Banks because he seemed to want all the money for botany. But what about Cook? So let's get right back to James Cook. What was he, his role as a fellow of the Royal Society? Because he was a real scientist. For example, uh, uh, he wrote... Um, in 1776, uh, he wrote a letter to the president of the Royal Society entitled How Health Was Kept Aboard the Resolution. So this is after the second uh, exp expedition. And this was read at the society's meeting in March 1776. Uh, and this was about how uh, Cook uh, claimed, uh, with some reason, to have had great success in keeping the uh, illness of scurvy which I will be talking out in a later about in a later video, keeping the illness of scurvy at bay and making sure that uh, very few of his sailors uh, suffered from it. Now, uh, the advances made in preserving the health of uh, Cook's sailors were overshadowed a little bit by the terrible death toll caused by the fevers cont contracted at Batavia after the lift ship left Australia. Uh, on the second, uh, nevertheless, on the second voyage, Cook was able to. Uh, uh, perfect some of the methods he had experimented with on the first, and although he had spent months out of sight of land, none of his crew died of scurvy. Uh, and uh, Cook in 1776 was awarded the Copley Medal by the Royal Society, and this is his Copley Medal by the Royal Society that he's received, uh, because of um, this uh, scientific achievement um, of avoiding uh, this, Ill this illness. Uh, but Cook had also reported to the, the, uh, the Royal Society the results of his observations of the transit of Venus uh, during the first um, expedition. Uh, and indeed, before that, he had already spoken to the Royal Society uh, about uh, his observations, or maybe he wrote, but in any case, he communicated to the Royal Society his observations of an eclipse of the sun. Uh, in any case, in 1775, uh, uh, he was proposed for membership. Uh, so after the second uh, um, expedition, uh, and uh, this is what he, he, the the uh, the proposal read: Captain James Cook of Mile End is a gentleman skillful in astronomy, and he is the successful conductor of two important voyages for the discovery of unknown countries. In this way, geography and natural history have been greatly advantaged and improved. Since he is desirous of the honor of becoming a member of this society, we whose names are underwritten do testify that we believe him deserving of such an honor and that he will become a worthy and useful uh, member. And so uh, he is um, uh, elected a member of the, uh, of, of the Royal Society. Now, of course, he's not gonna be a member for very long because quite, uh, uh, quite uh, swiftly, he goes off on the third uh, expedition, which does not end well for him. And so he's killed uh, in, in uh, Haiti. Uh, a little later, uh, and uh, it's certainly the case that because uh, his friend Joseph Banks uh, is president or becomes then president of the Royal Society, uh, that uh, Banks uses his position to memorialize Cook and to build upon his celebrity. For example, the Royal Society did decide to produce a medal uh, celebrating Cook. Uh, the medal features on one side a profile bust of Cook in uniform with the, 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 the slogan, yes, Cook, yak, yak that's uh, in Latin, James, Cook, uh, Oceani Investigator, yeah, um, 
uh, Cherimus, uh, some of the, the most, uh, I think it's the most bold, the most bold of invest of uh, um, explorers of explorers of of, uh, of the of the ocean. And the the Royal Society decided this in 1780. Uh, and it, interestingly enough, that that this was actually the only time that the Royal Society commemorated the death of one of its fellows in this way. So we can see that there are ways in which uh, Cook was already something of an exception and, and, and uh, well on his way to becoming a superhero. We already looked at uh, in, in a previous video at some of the, uh, uh, the odes which had written to Cook, which had been written to Cook. In any case, in February 1780, the council decided that they would produce gold medals and silver medals and bronze medals. Uh, and they said that it would cost you 20 guineas for a gold medal, one guinea for a silver medal or two bronze ones. Uh, and it seems that in total, they sold 22 gold ones, 322 silver ones and 577 one bronze ones. So it's, this is not uh, a mass product. Yeah, it's an elite product, but it's very uh, important and uh, it's very it's very uh, um, symbolic, um, if, you, uh, 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 if, if you like, of where uh, Cook wa was from. And so that's some um, of the history of the Royal Society uh, and uh, uh, then the role within it, which had been played by Cook. Now, to backtrack a little bit to the first uh, expedition, uh, I'm sure you remember that in addition to the official military instructions received uh, from the uh, Admiralty, both the open instructions and the secret ones, I I'm not quite sure how secret they were, but uh, supposedly secret ones, um, uh, which said that he should go uh, and uh, search for the southern continent and, and take possession of here and there uh, whenever he found it. Uh, he also received, and I think this is tremendously important, he also received this series of hints from the president of the Royal Society. And it's a fascinating document. Um, first of all, even for the title, hints, you know, it's like, you know, it's very polite suggestions. You know, I'm not giving you orders. I couldn't do that. But it's suggesting to so remember that the, the it was the Royal Society's idea to send uh, ships to Tahiti to observe the transit of Venus. Um, and the, the Admiralty decided that they could kill two birds with one stone. But these hints are very interesting. And in particular, the hints underline the importance of treating local peoples well and not killing them. Now, that's always appeared to me to be a little bit suspicious. I mean, if somebody says to you, okay, go to the shop and don't kill anybody, uh, you think, oh, well, they have a particular opinion of me, don't they? Uh, and so it, it, it's well worth asking why the uh, president of the Royal Society felt it necessary to underline so much the importance of not treating cruelly or murderously uh, local peoples. Well, they would have known the history of uh, Native Americans to some extent, and they would have known what was happening in India. And so uh, they uh, no doubt understood that um, such, uh, such uh, um, violence was possible or even probable, uh, given the sort of uh, mission uh, Cook was off on. Now I have more to say. I'm going to move on to ast astronomy next time, but that's almost 30 minutes. I'm going to stop there and leave astronomy and James Cook to the next video. Thank you very much for listening.